Hello and thanks for joining us for our first new show of the season. I'm joined by our critics, Lisa Nesselson in the studio. Welcome back, Lisa. And Emma Jones is at the Venice Film Festival. Hello, Emma. Now, hope you're doing well over there. The festival kicks off this Wednesday and it's an exciting lineup, isn't it? Yes, welcome to Venice. And as with Cannes this year, it really feels that the film industry is back in business on this glorious sunny day down here where all the celebrities are arriving for their press conferences and red carpets. The festival kicks off with a true cinema veteran, Pedro Almodovar, his latest film, Parallel Mothers, and it's his latest collaboration with the Spanish superstar Penelope Cruz. Now, interestingly, Almodovar says that this is the most difficult part that he's ever given Penelope Cruz to play uh, in their long history together. So that's quite saying something. And in Parallel Mothers, she plays one of two single mothers who give birth on the same day. And then in true uh, Spanish director style, this, this wonderful director, you know, their stories intertwine. And I think it's very much also an exploration um, on Almodovar's behalf of motherhood. Now, also for the, the beginning of the Venice Film Festival sidebar, the Horizonte section, we have French royalty coming. That's Isabelle Huppert. And that's for the film... The Promises, directed by Thomas Krutoff, and she's playing uh, the mayor of a small town near Paris who's offered a ministerial post, and that promises to be a really interesting uh, rub between the idea of ambition personally and your duty towards the people you represent. So there's a lot to look forward to. I can definitely hear a lot of excitement in the background, Emma. When it comes to <laughs> yes. red carpet glamour, the list of big names is impressive this year. Are things going back to normal, do you think? It feels that way because there is a glut of Hollywood films. And like it or not, at the beginning of September, we start talking about the Oscars. Venice has an impeccable record when it comes to showing Oscar winners here at this festival, including last year's Nomadland. And speaking of which, Chloe Zhao, who, of course, is the Oscar-winning director of that film, she is here on the jury, as is Bong Joon-ho, of course, the Oscar winner and Palm d'Or winner for Parasite. Uh, there's an awful lot of big films showing that have been delayed by the pandemic. One of them is Dune by director Denis Villeneuve. And this is a two and a half hour sci-fi epic. It's starring young superstar Timothy Chalamet and of course Oscar Isaac. Nobody can, everyone basically is really, really excited about seeing that one. And then there's another film by Jane Campion. Of course, she's another Palm Door winner, and that is The Power of the Dog. Uh, it's a Western, and it stars Benedict Cumberbatch and Kirsten Dunst. Now, of course, Venice, unlike Cannes, they don't have a complicated relationship, let's say, with Netflix, so they've got no problems at all showing that film, and that's really touted as one for Oscar nominations, possibly later this year. Also, over the next few days, I think you're going to be seeing celebrities such as Jessica Chastain, you'll be seeing uh, Olivia Coleman, possibly, and Vincent Landon, if you want to see more French superstars on the red carpet here. And Emma, anything else in particular that we should be looking out for this year? Yeah, I think everyone is also talking about a film called Spencer. Now, this is Pablo Lorraine's latest film. If you know his work, you'll know that he's also done very interesting uh, subjects of Jackie O as well. Uh, and I think... People are really excited about Spencer because, of course, it is a portrait of Princess Diana with Kristen Stewart in the leading role. And after the success of the latest series of Netflix's The Crown, a lot of critics are speculating, you know, can Kristen Stewart pull off this portrayal of Princess Diana? Now, the trailer became available really recently, so let's have a look at this, that and see the similarity between the two. They know 
everything. They don't. Wow, she looks just like her, doesn't she? Um, Emma Jones in Venice, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the festival. Hopefully we'll hear from you in the next few weeks or days. Now, Lisa, you've been on the festival circuit as well. You're off to Deauville later this week. Let's talk now about some French film news. And the James Bond actress Léa Seydoux was in four films at the Cannes Film Festival in July. Um, she couldn't go because she tested positive for COVID. Her latest movie on screens here in France is called France. Um, she plays a news anchor on a leading 24-hour news channel. Is Bruno Dumont's latest feature... Good news or bad news? Well, there were people in Cannes who thought this was um, one of the worst films in the competition, but I have to say, I enjoyed it. It's sometimes heavy-handed, sometimes sly, both irreverent and sincere, and it helps to know something about how the uh, audiovisual horizon here in France went from fairly relaxed to fairly frenetic over these past few decades. Now, sound bites are still much, much longer on French television than they are in, say, the US. And uh, there are lots of shows devoted to debating current events. Young people receive instruction in audiovisual literacy. The mayor of Cannes insists on it from when kids start school through high school. So it should be at least a little harder to bamboozle the average French television viewer. Now, the main character's name here is a dead giveaway about the film's tone. France demeure. That works as a name, but it also hints at the idea that France, the country, is eternal, even if the nation stumbles sometimes. France is a real hotshot who loves her job, uh, apparently more than she loves her husband and her son, and she's smart and slick and relentlessly in charge, in control, until a minor traffic accident turns her world inside out. Okay, well, let's take a look at France demeure in her element. Le gars qui est là-bas, là, il se lève et il brandit son arme. Action Allez, cela Coupé J'ai l'impression d'avoir euh, une mission. Génial Talent qu'elle a, cette fille. Vous savez tout, c'était formidable. Formidable C'était formidable euh, de ne pas mourir. Vous, les journalistes, on change rapport. Vous courez après l'audimat. Et donc Alors, vos leçons de morale, vous les gardez pour vous, les vôtres et vos idiots utiles. Ça va aller, ma puce. On va aller chez Dior pour choisir les bijoux et la robe. So after France knocks a young man off his motorbike, she undergoes a strange transformation. She does. Uh, usually in movies, an individual who survives, um, uh, who's, who survives a plane crash or a natural disaster uh, reorders their priorities. Here, France herself is unscathed, but accidentally almost killing a young man puts her in touch with the human emotions she's been keeping at bay in order to be detached, and it must be said, efficient, if needlessly razzle-dazzle as a reporter. OK, well, next to the critics' favourite Cannes competition film. It didn't win the top prize, but it was awarded um, Best Screenplay. It has an English title. It's a Japanese film, and it's in half a dozen languages. Tell us about Drive My Car. Well, still grieving over his wife's death, an actor and theatre director agrees to direct a multilingual production of Uncle Vanya in... Uh, to be staged in Hiroshima. And um, the director, Ryosuke Hamaguchi, takes his inspiration from a Haruki Murakami short story to make a long movie with plenty of intriguing twists and turns in the road. It's sexy and mysterious, and these interlocking narrative layers are always fun to contemplate because the leads are so attractive and their feelings are so raw. And there are 40 minutes of sex, death, illness and art, even before the opening credits. That's right. Uh, and when we, uh, t after that, we've met Yasuki Kafuku and his wife of 20 years, Oto, a screenwriter for uh, Japanese TV. They're always bouncing story ideas off each other. And that's whether they're in bed or especially on their commute in the car, which serves as a sort of writer's room with a steering wheel, windshield. A mishap on the road leads to a startling discovery that means Kafuku really shouldn't be driving himself or others. So after tragedy strikes, a very discreet woman named Misaki is assigned to drive Kafuku wherever he needs to go while his production of Uncle Vanya takes shape. Are we more likely to become an open book on the open road. If playfully accurate, you know, the signs over the road might say, this way to guilt or off road to closure. Either way, by degrees, the chauffeur and her passenger end up influencing each other's lives. And it's a privilege to eavesdrop on that process. Okay, Lisa Nessel, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to leave you with a taster of Drive My Car. Thanks for your company. Remember our website, we're also on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. Yes.
妻を亡くし喪失を抱えて生きる男とある過去を持つドライバーの女私はあの車が好きですとても大事にされているのがわかるので僕がお父さんから聞いた話をしてもいいですかどこでもいいから走らせてくれないか孤独な二人が旅の果てに見つけたものとはドライブ・マイ・カー